Welcome back to Balancing Chaos with Kelly and Gretchen. And today we have our guest, Rebecca. So Rebecca, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Rebecca Liberty. I am a proud resident of Bangor, Maine for a little over five years now. The little city neighborhood, since I can join in the uh, neighborhood <laughs> friendly rivalry here. Um, so happy, happy little city resident and uh, mother and wife and citizen and neighbor and um, also an ordained pastor in the Lutheran Church. Uh, that's the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which is different from other Lutheran denominations that trace themselves back to Martin Luther, but are in sort of a different place theologically and politically and socially than the ELCA. So until recently, I was serving a church here in Bangor and now am in transition, which is why this introduction is so long and complicated because in times of transition, it can, you know, when you don't have a I am this and I do that, yeah. um, it takes a little bit longer. So I'm also a writer and life coach and consultant and facilitator and um Lots of other things that combine people working together for good and trying to figure out their lives and, you know, balancing chaos. <laughs> <laughs> I love that was an awesome introduction. Hey, thanks. Yes. I've, been, I've been working on it. So tell me what did you say ELCC? ELCA stands E-L-C-A. for, yes, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Mm-hmm. Now you told me that you'd been listening to some podcasts, so you know that I grew up Baptist, maybe. I don't know if you'd heard any of those. Okay. And so what does, what do Lutherans in the E-L-A-A? E-L-C-A. E-L-C-A believe? That's always a really, um, it's a good question. So what do Lutherans believe? Well, the E-L-C-A is a Christian church. We trace the foundation to Jesus Christ. The the evangelical term, um, which gives some people pause sometimes because they're not sure in what sense we use that word, um, it actually comes from the Greek evangel, which just means gospel. Mm. So Evangelical Lutheran Church in America basically says we believe in the good news of Jesus. Um, So that's, that's the evangelical part. It doesn't have all of the layers of um, of political things that it has come to mean in other settings. Mm. Um, so the ELCA um, is considered more on the progressive side, although there's a ton of diversity politically and socially within the denomination. Um, but it's a it's what's known as a liturgical church. Um, people would group it sort of with Catholic and Episcopalian and others who have sort of a a set order of worship. One thing that I would say is that I have, and I have said in my my own way that, oh, and evangelical Christians are the ones who tend to, I hear that term and think of the type of Christians that do not care about the good news of Jesus, but want to spread, I don't know, hate and fear, you know, to be perfectly blunt as the atheist in the room, Mm -hmm. is that I don't necessarily have a good association. So this is very interesting to hear that evangelical does not mean that. Right. I think that... I know that you don't spread hate and fear. You're awesome. Oh, thanks, (laughs) Gretchen. I think those people, that political association with evangelicals, those people who do that, because again, I have people in my own family that have these beliefs, I don't think they see it as spreading hate and fear. But I think you see it that way, and mm-hmm. I certainly see it that way. Do you see it that way? This is always tricky in a conversation about comparisons because I always try to kind of stay grounded in where I stand and what I believe and the best I can to speak for my church mm-hmm. rather than speaking for other people. Right. Um, so that's it's a little bit tricky to yeah. say that, yeah. but um, certainly... Um, as the ELCA and as a church with evangelical in our name, right. we do a fair amount of um, distancing from some things that are out there that we don't see as expressing good news mm-hmm. of Jesus. But that's not really what the ELCA is known for. The ELCA is actually known for um, social service, social justice, um, there's a youth gathering going on this summer where 
um, you know, teenagers from all over the country are serving and learning and worshiping. And so, I mean, it's really, um, it's really known for actually good works in the world, but there's this theological fine point of we don't do these things because God needs us to do them. We do them because our neighbors need us to do them. Right. Um, we're not trying to earn salvation. We're trying to show God's love in the world. So do, do the Lutherans believe in the Bible? The yes. new king and the old king? James the, the New the Testament old, and the old king James version? Are... Um, so we, yes, Old Testament, New Testament, or mm-hmm. as more neutrally called Hebrew scriptures and Christian scriptures. Uh-huh. Um, Yes. Um, In the ELCA, this is one of the things that um, is different than some other Christian denominations, is that we um, do not read the Bible literally, um, that we believe the Bible is inspired word of God, but that um, it has been and continues to be interpreted by people, Um, that it was not literally dictated word for word inerrantly, Mm -hmm. um, but that... um, it, it requires interpretation and has layers of interpretation built into it. Um, mm-hmm. And so the way that we read the Bible as the word of God, um, you just say that phrase and it sounds like everything else comes with it, but actually we don't read it in quite the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, but that makes sense if you just if you took if you just took yourself outside of religion and just looked at it pragmatically, it was written by it was rewritten by multiple people. Right. Well, it's been translated into yeah. and out of different languages. Right. Um, <laughs> and you never use Google Translate. Yeah. There's probably been some things lost in translation. Yeah. Right. And, and copied <laughs> and sometimes copied wrongly. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you get into biblical study and it's, it's fascinating. Um, and also kind of miraculous that it, is, it remains as powerful as it is. But that some of that power is it being read as word of God in community and to, you know, take what it says and say, what does this have to do with our lives here in Bangor, Maine in 2018 is is really pretty fascinating work. Mm. So let's just I want to ask you a couple controversial questions about. Oh, (laughs) about I should have seen this coming about the Bible and the interpretations or how would you describe Bible's stance on same sex, or what is written in the Bible on same sex relationships? Mm-hmm. Well, first, let me say that there are people who who specialize in this area of biblical study, and I am not one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's what I understand as kind of a big picture, and here's what I preach: mm-hmm. um, God is about love. Yeah, God is love. That's sort of priority number one, the ground on which we stand, the air in which we move. Um, and so that that's everything. This was something Luther was really um, strong on. He said, you interpret everything in the Bible through that lens. Virtually everything written in the Bible related to same-sex relationships was in such a different cultural context. There, I mean, the way even heterosexual marriage is practiced today was completely unknown in biblical times. It doesn't mean that the Bible then becomes useless to talk about relationships, but that is one area where we have to be really careful to interpret. So then you just start, then you just have to go back to the, what is the most loving thing here Mm -hmm. you know what how do we how do we view everything with the most generous and loving lens Mm -hmm. Um, and your church is a uh, reaffirming what's the term so uh, people often know the term in the united church of christ open and affirming yes um we have the same thing it's just our name for it is not as clear it's called reconciling in christ yes and so within the elca um, there's this designation, and it's a process that congregations go through to become, to sort of declare themselves reconciling in Christ, which says we are a congregation or a seminary or a region um, who see and value and welcome and invite and embrace and every possible word you could use, um, the presence and gifts and leadership 
um, and relationships and marriages of LGBTQ folks. So that's not specific to the Lutheran Church, but it's specific to the the par- the parish. Yes, the congregation. Congregation. Yeah, um, and then also some Lutheran schools and other other bodies right. have have become reconciling in Christ as well. And the the Bangor congregation, Redeemer Lutheran Church, um, has been a reconciling in Christ congregation and has oh, had I a know. has had a presence at the um, Bangor Pride Parade for some years now. It's on my spreadsheet. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Gretchen made me a spreadsheet, which I think we've talked about a couple of times about <laughs> different churches. But that's interesting to know, too, because when I was making the spreadsheet, like some churches, it seemed like like this, like I, and I forget which one it was. I truly forget. But it was like, this seems like a really open, this seems like a pretty decent church, but they don't have this like seal of approval mm-hmm. that the other churches do. But then I would look up like the religion and then some other of that faith would have that. So that that answers my my logistical question on this. Well, I can't, again, I can't speak to any other (laughs) denominations besides Lutheran, but that's, that's how it works in the Lutheran church. I mean, it is a process because, um, you know, like most complicated things, it's, it's not when you get right down to the personal level, it's not black and white. And so in any given congregation, you have people who are more or less comfortable in theory and in practice. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, you may find that a congregation is perfectly welcoming, but there are still some people who are uncomfortable enough that they haven't taken the step to, you know, be public. You know, so you just never. Right. You sort of have to check it out. Gotcha. It's interesting because I I grew up Baptist, but I, I remember early on, maybe when I was five, I think at the earliest memory, I have a homosexual uncle Mm -hmm. and I of course love him dearly and but the the family loves him but is against the fact that he's homosexual and I remember age five thinking this is such hypocrisy if you say (laughs) God is love and God loves people then why are we essentially being discriminatory toward him even though we're loving him we're not really we do treat him differently we do make him feel bad Mm. about the person he loves and then if we think about other things like divorce, if we're going to be technical, I mean, about the Bible, right, we mm-hmm. shouldn't get divorced, but we do. And then we still love those people who get divorced and they're fine. But this same sex relationship isn't fine. And then we also had this, a person in my church owned a pornography store, mm-hmm. but he was very beloved, but he wasn't a homosexual. So I just, I remember having these thoughts when I was very, very young thinking, well, this makes no sense at all. Well, I'm just not going to believe that. I'm just going to have my own belief. I believe in God. I believe in love. I believe that God wouldn't want us to be discriminatory toward these people. So this is just how it's going to be. I'm reconciling it in my own brain. But this is, sound may sound kind of crazy, but I never thought that maybe I just wasn't that religion. Hmm. You know, that mm-hmm. this all could work for me. I could have all these same beliefs in God and my own personal relationship in God and I didn't have to be in a spiritual religious environment that had such differing beliefs as my own, you know? Mm. And that's when (laughs) Gretchen's like, you know, you can still believe in God and have all your same beliefs and be in a congregation of people who have these same beliefs as you about these other issues like same-sex marriage. And social justice. And social and justice and guns. and guns and, you know, these very I'm a, I'm an atheist spiritual leader. <laughs> I believe in spreadsheets. <laughs> That's a different but, kind of gospel. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I used the analogy before on the podcast, but I was like, you know, I'm listening to this and it's like hearing someone say, like, I love ice cream. Oh, my God, I love ice cream. Ice cream is so good. I always get vanilla ice cream. Every time I eat vanilla ice cream, though, I get sick. But I love ice cream, so I'll still eat the vanilla ice cream, even though I get sick. It's fine. And then, like, finding out you're allergic to vanilla, be like, oh, I can love ice cream and just have chocolate and not get sick every time I eat it and still, like, have my ice cream and eat it and feel good about everything. So I'm like, she just needs a different flavor. Hmm. Well, and it's interesting because the church that I essentially was raised in, I feel that the pastor does a pretty decent job not tiptoeing into controversial topics publicly, like Mm -hmm. same-sex relationships and um, guns or anything that's political. So I didn't I could either I could quite often push it in the back of my head, but then the people, the community associated with that religion, have these very strong 
beliefs. So whenever a political issue came to light, like the guns, it was actually the guns that tipped me over, which it seems silly because I don't know why I wouldn't be tipped over by hate towards same sex couples or or women against women or racism. I mean, that seems kind of crazy that that wasn't the tipping point, but maybe it was just the final straw of, mm-hmm. of it all. But I should have been mindful of it because when we moved away, we tried so many Baptist churches and we'd only, we'd go one or two times and they would say something so overtly hateful and offensive. Like one time they said that Obama was the Antichrist. Well, that's pretty strong. Right? And so I thought, we never can go back to this church ever again because I didn't remember another past um, president being as publicly open about his belief in God and the Bible. I mean, he was, but because he wasn't a certain religion or because he was black, I wasn't sure what the issue was with with Obama or because he believed in same-sex couples. You know what I mean? So it's funny that I never came to the conclusion that I could change religions mm-hmm. and still believe in God. Like, I wouldn't go to hell if I changed religions, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. It's only taken me 35 years to come to this point. Well, you know, it takes what it takes <laughs> sometimes to grow personally and figure out, you know, what it is that we want and where we belong and where we find meaning and purpose. And Did, Were you raised Lutheran? I was. Yep. Yep. And so you're no longer a pastor. Well, well, you're a pastor still, but you're not yes. an act, you're not actively. Yes, the technical term in the Lutheran Church would be I am not under call. Okay, you're not under because call because when you are sort of serving a particular congregation or ministry, you are under call for that ministry. So I'm not under call, but I am still considered um, considered a pastor. You're still considered an ordained. And what's the process to become an ordained? Well, the Lutheran Church is. Um, it is in the um, in the tradition of educated clergy, um, and so it's a master's degree. It's a master's degree is required, master of divinity, um, and part of that is you train in hospital for chaplaincy. Um, it's called clinical pastoral education. Hmm. Eleven weeks of full time, basically hospital ministry. Um, Part of it is a year of internship in a congregation. Um, and then, so there's the seminary process, the educational process, but then also um, the national denomination is split up into 62 regions, which are called synods. And then the synod has a process of um, basically sort of walking with you um because you don't get ordained as a Lutheran pastor in general. Lutherans believe really strongly um, that the call, the call to ministry is both internal, like the way that you feel and the way that you sense God directing you, um, but it's also external. Like you don't become a pastor until there's a specific group of people who want you to be their pastor. Hmm. So it's a little bit different than some other denominations where you sort of get ordained and then um, are either sent somewhere or sort of available once you're ordained. In in the Lutheran Church, you don't get ordained until there is a call for you hmm. to a particular place. So it's sort of it's sort of interesting. It's something actually I've sort of carried into my own sense of faith of this belief in the external call. Like it matters what people want you to do, yeah. not just what, what you want, you to, want do. to do. Right. Um, so how did you that. first get how did you first get called? Um, well, let me let me just finish and say that that's how the external call is is kind of discerned. Like it's the it's the responsibility of the synod and a group of people within that to kind of affirm that yes, we we can see we can imagine a group of people wanting you to be their pastor. So, um, you asked, how did I yeah. first? Um, gosh. How much longer do we have? (laughs) Um, It can be a really long story. I'll try to tell it in a short way. So I graduated from college in 1994. um, And it was a time, so I had majored in American studies, but with that interdisciplinary major, I'd ended up writing a a theological thesis, sort of by accident, because it was what I was most interested in. I was doing, um, I was writing about this um, this woman in 19th century who became a shaker and sort of got in and out of all of these different religious communities and was sort of doing this study on individual religious experience. And so ended up 
writing this theological thesis. Um, and so sort of backing into this interest in church and theology. And um, I went from college into Harvard Divinity School, mostly to continue that academic study because I had backed into it at the very end of my undergraduate and gone, oh, wait, this stuff is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Why didn't I study this before? So I sort of tacked on two years and it was in that time that around that time there was a lot being written and a lot being noticed about second career pastors, particularly women who had, you know, done, done another career or had kids and raised them. And then as a second career would go to seminary and do ministry. And I thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a second career pastor. Now I just have to find a first career. Um, and so I was going to do more study or I was going to work for social justice. Um, and basically it was sort of a process of elimination of like, no, that's not quite the right thing. No, that's not quite the right thing. And finally it was like, okay, I get it. Um, I think this is supposed to be my first career and bummer because I was going to wait until I was older and wiser and could do this well. <laughs> I guess I'm just going to have to give it a shot. Um, so, so I went to seminary um, not really sure about where it was going to lead. Like it was, um, it was not like I knew where the end point was and I was really invested in that. And was going to do whatever it took to get there. It was more like, no, the next right thing seems like going to seminary. And I will continue to discern, one of my favorite words, discern, um, discern what the right, the next right thing is after that. So is seminary, was Harvard Divinity School considered seminary? Well, I did a year there before transferring to a Lutheran seminary. Okay. So, but it does, it does qualify in the Lutheran church and many other churches for the theological education part. You could trans, you, you could be really like a transfer student to the seminary. I basically, yes. Yes. <laughs> I transferred my credits from Harvard into the Lutheran seminary and in Berkeley, that, California. And is that how, um, is that how most ministerial education is, is that you, go through the process for the denomination? No, it's it's different and I'm not very well versed in how it works yeah. in other churches. But that but but there's similarity between um that's why I said at the beginning the Lutheran church fits into tradition of educated clergy. Like not all denominations require a master's degree in that kind of theological study. Mm -hmm. Often it's more like you're raised up within a church and mentored and sort of certified and qualified within a particular church um, rather than the denomination as a whole. Or, there, or there's also those, you know, in my research, I have seen that there are also some sort of unaccredited colleges, air quotes, because it's audio, you know, that do minister education. Yep. But it's yeah. not, Harvard is accredited. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, <laughs> but but actually, I should say my degree is from Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in Berkeley. Right. Um, I have to feel like a, and I would think that a seminary in Berkeley would be a really interesting place. Yeah, to it, be. it 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 was a fascinating place. Um, it's now part of California Lutheran University. A lot of seminaries are sort of changing how they structure themselves um, in these changing times. Um, but at the time that I went, which was, um, let's see, I graduated in 2001. Um, so the seminary was part of, still is part of the Graduate Theological Union. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole number of seminaries and you can take classes at different ones. And um, mm -hmm. so it's, um, it's a really unique opportunity for theological education. So where was your first congregation? My first congregation was in Silicon Valley. Oh, was, oh wow. Uh, which is where I had grown up. <laughs> So oh, you it's, not, it's not as Valley. exotic as it sounds because I was What's down, it like there? down the street from where I grew up. Um, Compared to here. Just briefly, oh I know I'm, I'm on a tangent, but I, I didn't know that that's where you were from. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's where I lived from about age eight through graduated from high school. Mm. Um, gosh, there's a lot of people there. Oh, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's a city. It had to have changed so much in your time there. My dad, like we've talked about this, my dad was born there and lived there until he was eight, actually. Yeah. And then they traveled around the country. But yeah, well, I mean, I think it it began changing a long time before we moved there. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it sort of is the way that you think it is. I mean, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of people and there's a lot of money mm-hmm. um, and a fair amount of education mm-hmm. um, and also a lot of income disparity. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's an, inc- you know, it's gotten just gotten more and more expensive to live there. And um, so I haven't lived in the Bay Area for, I think, uh, 12 years now because my first two calls in ministry actually were in the were in the Bay Area um, so is this why you moved to Bangor oh n- no <laughs> 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 no so I was in the Bay Area I was in my first congregation for about a year and a half and then came this really interesting and different sort of call I served as a campus minister at a Catholic university in huh. just down the road in Santa Clara also in Silicon Valley and I was called there on a very specific project around vocation discernment, which um, vocation in this sense, the broadest sense of what is my calling, what is my purpose, um, what are my different roles, and how do I live them out according to what matters most to me. So I, my job was helping students discern vocation and make choices about their future and and so that was that was really an um, really a life and ministry changing experience, both in the um, serving alongside Catholics who were in the Jesuit tradition, the tradition of Saint Ignatius of Loyola, um, which was very different kind of spirituality than the Lutherans um, than I had learned from Lutherans growing up, um, and really really valuable insights. Mm. Um, So then from there, I served a church in Reno, Nevada. So I started slowly making my way east. (laughs) Um, And while I was serving in Reno, um, I fell in love with a man who grew, who had grown up in Ellsworth, Maine. Oh, <laughs> and see? Uh, I had I had been bitten by the New England bug in college because I had gone to college in Western Massachusetts and always wanted to live in New England again. Where'd you go to college? Amherst College. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and so um, when we were deciding we were going to be together, but where were we going to go? I thought a pretty easy decision. Hard, you know, hard to leave all my family behind in the Bay Area, but nobody thought I was going to live in the Bay Area forever. Um, so for me, it was it was pretty easy to decide to move to Bangor, Maine. I had come to visit and absolutely loved it. Well, I'd also think that it's probably hard to be clergy in the Bay Area when you talk about income. I mean, I don't think that ministers make seven figures. No, no, not usually. (laughs) (laughs) So it would be hard to like just like the quality of life and cost of living would be very tough. Yeah, churches. Yeah, congregations in the Bay Area really have to think about how to how to do that. Mm -hmm. How to you know? I mean, well, like any any employers in the Bay Area have to think about how to do that. Um, So yeah, it's it's much um, it's a much different much different way of life here, which I appreciate. So you've lived here five years. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, but um, almost six, coming up on six. And what do you love about living here? Oh, um, so much. Love, love people and neighborhoods and sort of an entrepreneurial spirit. And Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I just, I think I've kind of bought into the whole the way life should be. I love that quote. Uh, yeah. So true. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I I said um, I think out loud. So I said to a friend not that long ago this thing that really kind of surprised me, but I've been thinking about how it's kind of true. I said I feel about Maine, kind of the way I feel about church, in that it's sort of like this community in the broadest sense, where it's more possible to live a sane life than it is in many other ways mm-hmm. and places. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and by that I mean sort of values and habits and way, sort of ways of looking at the world that sort of respect people and the environment and sort of common human dignity and love. And um, I don't know, I, I, I see... For me, I find those things both in faith communities and also in Maine. No, which is I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense, but I'm still trying to figure out what it is that I meant by that. But that's the closest I can come so far. Which is really interesting because there was just um, 
and I, I bookmarked it on my on my computer to uh, put in the show notes, but there was just a thing that came out saying the pop the states that have the least church affiliated populations or but the nuns which we've talked about yes. uh, you know and so it's not n-u-n-s like catholic nuns but the n-o-n-e-s nuns those who check none off on religion which is what i would do so it's interesting that you find that even though we are one of the least religious states in the country yeah but i think i think most i i think many people would agree that you know, people who are unaffiliated with mm-hmm. a faith community have ways of loving their families and their neighborhoods and doing good things in the world. And mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's actually um, like I found it a good challenge to make a case for why it's good to be part of a faith community and practice faith and um because so many of those good things I see people have and do outside of faith communities as well. Right. Um, and I think my, some of my my closest, my best friends, they are, they've they never in my life since I've known them been affiliated with any kind of faith community. And one I know grew up Catholic but has never been an active in the Catholic Church since we've been friends since we were freshmen in high school. And... I asked them recently because we've been giving my one friend a really hard time. She's very similar to Gretchen. Uh, <laughs> so she's really cool then. Yeah, she's super <laughs> extremely liberal. She may she actually sometimes identifies herself as a socialist. And she's just oh my the two of them will send me the same news articles within an hour of each other I'm like yeah (laughs) you guys are on the same wavelength there but anyway she we've been kind of giving her a hard time because she's an art teacher she's really hippie and apparently in her interview she she had a new interview for a job and she brought up she used the phrase that she was called or something to the effect of she was called to this position or I can't remember the exact phrasing but it was along those same lines so you'd love it and we were, my other friend and I, we were kind of making fun of her because it's just something I can't even imagine her ever saying. We're like, what happened to you? Seriously. She's like, guys, I really feel this. So we got into this kind of conversation about how I said, well, do you guys believe in God? And so then they, they both said they do. And it kind of shocked me because they've never been affiliated with the church. We've actually really never had the conversation. They know that I've been a very active um, Christian and, and they've obviously never given me a hard time about it. Obviously we wouldn't be friends if they did. Um, But I was surprised. It surprised me that they did believe in God because they don't affiliate with any church. I don't even know if they've ever been to church since I've known them. So even though they may check none Mm -hmm. on the box, it doesn't mean that they're atheists either. Right. So I've been reading about this. Okay. Because it's really, it's very interesting. First of all, um, I I brought these numbers because they don't always roll off my tongue if they're not in front of me. So two-thirds of the country's unaffiliated adults say they believe in God. So that's actually more common than than you might think. Okay. Um, but so I recently read I recently read this book called Choosing Our Religion. Oh. The I'm gonna find the subtitle here. The Spiritual Lives of America's Nuns. Um, And that is also (laughs) (laughs) N-O-N-E-S. It's a book by Elizabeth Drescher. It came out in 2016. Um, And she wrote about sort of how many how many ways there are to be a nun and to sort of arrive there, either growing up as a nun or leaving a particular faith community um, or simply, you know, sort of drifting in the sense that you might still feel draw on it for some resources or practice um, you know, prayer that you learned there or something. But, um, but she said, actually, nuns and f- people who are affiliated with faith communities often have more in common than you might think. One mm-hmm. of the, my favorite things that she talks about is she talks about people member, affiliated with the faith community as a sum, hmm. um, S-O-M-E, <laughs> um, you know, nun, nuns and sums. Mm-hmm. And and I, from from my perspective, after um, these years being close to faith communities, that that seems about right. Hmm. Um, that there are people who, you know, adopt practices from other faiths, <clears throat> excuse me, or will change religious affiliations in their lives too, which is also really really common. 
So maybe I should read that book. I guess I'm identified as a nun right now. I got I've been I got really anxious and stressed about it, and wasn't exactly sure what I was gonna do. Gretchen made me a spreadsheet. <laughs> I was gonna start going to churches, but I still felt quite angry. Mm-hmm. So my husband and I had a conversation about it, and we talked about just taking the summer off completely. Mm-hmm. And just regrouping in the fall, mm-hmm. and not well, a so lot that of the churches change pressure. their schedules for summer, so they expect lower attendance yeah. based on my research. Well, it's just <laughs> there's a lot of pressure on me, and then I was feeling guilt that I hadn't rejoined or found a different church or hadn't even been exploring churches. And so he said, "You know, why don't we just take the summer off? And it's all right. Mm-hmm. And we'll think about well, it, and we will go back in the fall." <clears throat> I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. There is a really. Um, I mean, it's really unfortunate. There are a lot of people out there who've experienced very real harm yeah. um, across a whole spectrum mm-hmm. um, fr- in, in religious communities and from their families based on religion. Um, and, and it really is sort of a traumatic experience that com- comes back in other faith communities often. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, you know, not every nun has that experience, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that I've I've heard some of my progressive clergy friends talk about some of what we need to be about in the church is helping people heal mm-hmm. from pain that they've experienced in other faith communities, mm-hmm. um, and of, often through the best of intentions. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you were saying before, mm-hmm. um, but that doesn't diminish the very real pain and trauma that that can cause too. Right. I do. Um, just because people I love, I've seen them behave in certain ways, but I believe that they, they believe they're doing this out of love. It seems really, it seems hypocritical. It seems crazy, but I, I don't want to believe in my heart that they're doing it of a vindictive or evil place. They really believe, oh, I love this person. I don't want to see them go to hell. Mm -hmm. It, although it makes no sense because if you look at the Bible and it says, you know, sin is sin, at least this is how I've interpreted it. We don't rank sin. Mm-hmm. We're all sinners. Therefore, how can your sin of being a, a homosexual be worse than my sin of gossip? Mm-hmm. Is it, am I wrong to think that? Well, that makes sense to me. Okay, right. And so I just think, I don't know how we got to this place where somehow within religious structures, and I know it's not just Baptists, but other religions too, where certain sins are more Mm -hmm. severe or punished at a more severe place than other sins. It doesn't just does not make logical sense to me. Hmm. And this is what I've really been struggling with Mm -hmm. because my mom got pregnant with me as a teenager and she was in a Christian school and she got kicked out. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the opposite of what you do as a Christian when a child makes a mistake that has that severe of implications on their life and furthermore especially if you don't believe in abortion mm-hmm. so the child makes a mis- sins but then doesn't continue the sin and I'm just speaking from their beliefs mm-hmm. by having an abortion so they essentially do what is considered right but then mm-hmm. they get punished quite severely that doesn't make sense to me mm-hmm. these are some of the issues I've been struggling with so I think taking a break is good for me because I feel so angry about it Mm -hmm. that it's almost made me mad at all religion which is I know not fair Mm -hmm. to to God or religion because it's not that God did it it's people who did it right um and I've been listening to the liturgist podcast do you Mm. have you listened to that I haven't oh you should listen to the two on evangelicalism Mm. because they have that a lot of people come in and talk about and pastors about evangelicals and how it has kind of a negative political mm-hmm. affiliation right now and they go deep into that it's very interesting mm. so yeah and I've kind of come to that place where ooh, I don't want to actually affiliate with this type of religious group who is known to be so closely connected to Donald Trump and all of these really horrible things well, <laughs> well and that's like the the whole the whole issue with the border family separation exactly like that and the administration saying well it's biblical to follow the law and this is just what we're doing mm-hmm. and my mom is a retired teacher and is she was she considers herself christian but was just like outraged and people on her facebook were like no they they're breaking the law that's tough luck 
that's the punishment. And so I actually quoted the Bible. <laughs> Way to go. And it was, you probably know it, but the one like, because, you know, when I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Yes. You know, you know the, the numbers and all that. But I was like, you know, no, I, you know, like, fine, I'm an atheist, but like, this is what I believe. Like, oh, is there something that you need that I can help you? Like, my goal as an atheist is to just be the person that is good to people and stands up for people and helps protect people and does all of that without being called by some other power to do it. Just like, I think that this is the right thing to do. There was also, I sent you a quote. I wish I could find it now. Do you remember that quote I sent you about how God isn't like going to church, but it's about all the things you do during your life to help. Like it's just about helping people in general. That's what serving God is, is by Right. Just being good you are and the helping church. people. I've heard yeah. that sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, that's the place where I come from is, you know, if you struggle with addiction, I don't want to judge you. I don't I haven't led I haven't walked your path. That's a disease just the same way that diabetes is a disease, but as a Christian I wouldn't judge your diabetes. So why right. would I judge your addiction? And in terms of immigration, and I'm again not an expert on it, but just looking at it from a place of love, people are fleeing where they're coming from because they're terrified or they they're hoping for something better for their kids. They're not. They're not. I know there's probably some quote unquote evil people trying to commit get a, crimes, but get that's a, not get a slice of the American exactly, pie. Exactly. That yeah. is. It's just like anything. It's just like welfare. When we think of welfare, and then people criticize welfare and accuse everyone of living off the government and this and that yes you're always going to have outliers on either side of any kind of population or situation but that's not the norm Mm -hmm. the norm on welfare is people either don't want to be on it or they're doing everything they possibly can to hopefully get off someday well especially with the rise in income inequality yeah and health care issues and like there's so many other factors that go into that Uh, there was one that um they wanted to make and this is in the, I think this this is in Maine, one of the policies that's been put out there is, oh, you're going to have to work if you're going to get SNAP benefits, like um, food stamps and stuff. But the statistics are, is that like 90% of the people who already get food already have a job. Already work, right? right. They already work. They just can't afford to, they don't make enough money because of income inequality and stagnant wages to afford food and food, like Melanie had said a couple of weeks ago, food prices are probably about to go up because there's and partly because they can't get um and my my grandmother grew up on an avocado orchard in california and one of my friends who lives in california was just saying that the avocados they can't get migrant workers to pick the to harvest the avocados because they're afraid the ice is going to come and deport them so now you and and they're not able to get they're not getting people from a silicon valley job to go down there and harvest avocados instead you know so it's this whole thing of and it's going to show up in our in our food supply is going to show up in the expenses for food it's going to show up in all these other places yeah well we have a friend who probably works would you say 80 hours a week and she uses main care you know and so it's not like people think oh if you're on main care you're just sucking off the government sitting on your couch watching soap operas all day and it's the people that i see in my job and in my life who are using resources are not the it's not the picture that's being presented in these conversations or in the media so and then unfortunately this this somehow is connect gets connected to to religion in my experience and that's where i have all these troubling concerns because it just seems so counterproductive to the message. Well, one of your issues was that healthcare shouldn't be provided was the healthcare issue with your former church. Yeah, someone posted after uh, main care expansion passed, someone posted if you thought healthcare was expensive, wait until it's free. And this was coming from someone who has a senior level position at a church and I just thought this is really odd to me that you wouldn't want people to have access to basic needs. Healthcare is a basic need. And how much is it really increasing your tax? Mm-hmm. You know, how much do you think mm-hmm. it's really increasing our tax? Mm-hmm. And I guess I would willing, I'd be willing. how expensive would it be to have them not insured and then. Yeah. And that's the, the, the bigger issue is that people don't understand healthcare and how it works. And it's, we're, we're all paying much more because of the, our messed up system we have. And we pay much less if we had a universal system, but that's, no, that's a lot to get into, and no one's 
a lot of people who are at that place are never going to listen to that argument anyway. So, so it's yeah. irrelevant. But it, when these issues tie into religion and they're they're so pol- I feel like the message and the actions are so polar opposite of what the message mm-hmm. should be. Mm-hmm. It's really taking me to a place. Mm-hmm. A place of learning an, and an uncomfortable, place. <laughs> an uncomfortable, an place angry place. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the guns, guns aren't even in the Bible, right? Right. Okay, so I'm not crazy <laughs> about the guns. I don't understand. Pretty, pretty sure they didn't have guns back then. Okay, thank you for yeah, confirming that. So God did not specifically say in the Bible we all get guns and are ready forever, right? Pretty Peace sure. Peace out. Have a great sure summer. That's not in there. Lilas, Jesus. No. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. The um. So. You are a mother. You have children. Yes. yes so I what do. is it like to, because this, and I'm asking you this because I it came up in one of our conversations when we did the leadership program that I never really thought of it, but if you're a minister or you're a pre, uh, preacher, pastor, pastor, pastor yeah. um, and a mother, your weekends are, mm-hmm. you work a seven day a week job. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> that That actually accounts for a great deal of the reason why I'm not serving as a pastor currently mm-hmm. um, um, because you know every everybody has as, as you well know on this podcast everybody balances their chaos in right. different <laughs> ways <laughs> right. and you know just like nurses and yeah. you know not not everybody works a five day week and I get that so yeah it's um, yeah I mean it's it's pretty pretty hard to get a, a I mean a congregation based in this tradition, pretty much always has Sunday worship um, for, for many historical and excellent reasons. And But yeah, but the other piece of it, too, was that I couldn't go to church with my kids and kind of in, introduce mm. them to this very powerful and meaningful experience and faith practice to me. Like, I felt like I was kind of missing out on that as a mother. And again, like, Mm-hmm. Clergy, clergy parents work this out in a hundred different ways. I mean, every family is different. Yeah. So I'm not saying these things are impossible to work out by any means. All kinds of people do it, but you don't get to make decisions for everybody else's family. You only get to make the ones that your own family is presented with. And so, um, but also when you're a full time pastor, you're also on call for emergencies. And it's not like other professions where you share the on call with people, right? Um, and it, it, as a solo pastor, became kind of hard to be the drop everything person in both at home and right. at church. Like everybody deserved better, it seemed. Yeah. Um, and again, mm-hmm. people work that out in a hundred different ways. But so this you, is the are, way that we mm-hmm. have. I've been. I, I mean, so pers- I'm not a pastor, but I've found that every year my kids age, I have to figure out how I'm going to balance better because there are po- there were points where I feel like okay, I'm not doing this well. Mm-hmm. I'm not being a mother well. I'm not being a professor well. I'm not being a researcher well. Something like something has to go, and I have to be at peace with it, mm-hmm. or otherwise I'm just going to be terrible. Feel like I'm constantly in chaos and I'm not doing anything well. Right, and it, that's not. That's not the way to be it either, right? right. So I, I know I can relate. So are you, so are you now attending your congregation? No, for a couple reasons. Um, one is that it's really hard to attend anything that you have once been the leader of. Mm-hmm. I mean, can you can you? And I know you're not a worship attender, but if you imagine attending something that you used to plan and lead, what goes through your head? <laughs> oh, yeah, like, 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 I wouldn't have done it that way. Yeah, yeah. so, so Ooh, I mean, there's just some, there's just yeah, some, really, there's just some real practical reasons why that's just hard. Right. Um, the, it, also, in our tradition, there are, there are rules and structures around that where you don't become a part of the community that you have served. Oh, interesting. Um, so it's both a rule and just kind of makes sense as a practice. So my family is also church shopping because Mm. the nearest ELCA church is um, about an hour away. Oh, wow. There's one in Ellsworth and one in Augusta, um, Mm. which is probably not where our family is going to become rooted and active. So um, the Lutheran Church is in communion with, um, which basically means they've gone through a process to say the things that we have in common are greater than the things that are different. So 
um, like Episcopal churches mm-hmm. and UCC, United Church of Christ churches and Methodist, um, mm-hmm. and also a couple other denominations that aren't, aren't very well represented mm-hmm. in Bangor. Um, so we're I, in some ways I'm right I'm right there with you. Yeah. <laughs> I feel so much if less you would alone. Like my spreadsheet, I can provide. It I, I might you. need to use Grouch. Oh, she's good detail on you there. You guys should like you guys should like talk about. Yeah, yeah but I should. This. I mean, there are a lot of really wonderful faith communities in town um yeah and uh you know redeemer redeemer lutheran church is one of them and if any of your listeners know a pastor who wants to serve a really great church they can be episcopalian or congregationalist or presbyterian or lutheran mm-hmm. and uh there's a great church in bangor looking for a full-time pastor and so. being in bangor is a great place to be. and mm-hmm. all they would have to do is listen to this podcast and hear how great it would be right. to live in <laughs> bangor and to have their pick of yeah. some really great neighborhoods how many more oh do gosh. we need to get before we get like the trophy from the city. On I don't fruits. know, but my friend, who's from Southern Maine, had emailed me about moving to Bangor. Her sister's interested in moving to Bangor, and then she thought about moving to Bangor. And I, you should see the email I sent her. It was, it was crazy. <laughs> I think like now we can't move to Bangor because Kelly's crazy. Like Twenty crazy Kelly's reasons there. why you should move to Bangor, oh, yeah. and it was. I want to see it. You have to forward it to me. Massive email. So anyhow, she, hopefully that works out because I'd love to have more. People say that Bangor's where Portland was ten years ago, hmm. and I can see that. Hmm. I don't think we're ever going to be Portland. We don't have the ocean right there, but mm-hmm. we have almost everything they have. And when I was at Whole Foods yesterday, I was talking <laughs> to the um, meat guy, mm-hmm. and he was saying he had he said that he, there are so many people from Bangor that bulk shop that he had been talking to his boss about just doing a one um, once a month or maybe every other month delivery wow. to Bangor. And I said, you would have people, and they're trying to capitalize on Prime now because Amazon bought Whole Foods. So they have all these deals now on sale prices. If you're Amazon Prime, you get 10% off. And I have noticed the prices have significantly dropped. So if they did some kind of deal with Prime and delivery to Bangor, I told I told them. Then I Bangor said, would be perfect. It would be perfect. I said, we all shop on Amazon. We don't have stores here. That's the one downside is that we, do you shop on Amazon? Sometimes. I am like, almost like I buy everything on Amazon. because yeah, we had an Amazon package today. I just brought I, I did, them. yes. I, order every, I ordered car seats for the kids. They just opened them. I don't shop. I hate shopping. And Amazon is convenient. Plus, we don't really have any place to shop unless you want to go to Target, which is fine. Yeah. Well, I've digressed. So tell me about this book. So, well, I was just going to say, we, you know, we love Bangor and we're not planning on going anywhere. So now I find myself in this um, interesting position of not doing what I've done for about 15 to 20 years um, and trying to figure out like, okay, well, what else? I'm, I'm like waiting for the person to say, maybe you guys are the ones to say it. What Bangor really needs from someone like you is. Ah. So... Um, yeah. yeah, we need a teen center. The Bangor Y is opening a teen center. I know, but how far out is it, and is it going to actually happen? Well, I don't know. It's what I've heard. I saw me too. Yeah, but I mean, she was telling Gretchen was saying because she had her she has kids at that age. There's really not much for them to do. Mm-hmm. The rec, they can't do rec, mm-hmm. and that's such a formative it's a time. Age. Mm-hmm. And to mm-hmm. think about all these kids who are just sitting at home all summer. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. so that's something. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah so so it. this so this book that I brought you is a book that I wrote. Um, let's see, about ten years ago, almost. Um, it's called "The Treasure Hunt of Your Life: Seeking Your Calling, Encountering God, Finding Yourself." And um, I wrote it after that job that I told you about about um, the vocation discernment with college students. Um, because a lot of the resources on like sort of how to ask those big questions of who am I and what do I belong to and what do I really want to offer to the world and where and with whom as my partner. I mean, all of those like really big questions that you sort of ask a lot of them all together as a young adult, but you never really stop. You know, like you said, every year, like, mm-hmm. how do I how do I want to parent this year? Right. Like it, it, it's always coming up again. Um, or what community is our faith community is our family going to belong to? So, I mean, mm-hmm. all of those, I would I would lump those all into vocational questions. Um, 
And a lot of what I was looking for to give to students, I just couldn't find something. There was a lot out there of sort of how to inventory your past life and what you've really enjoyed. And, you know, there were some college students, by no means all of them, but they'd say, well, what I really enjoy are video games. You know, what? how do I use this resource? And so it seemed like there needed to be something where you could just use now, mm-hmm. that you didn't have to have this whole work history in order to think about this. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote this book using a treasure hunt as the framework for thinking about these big questions of you don't have to know where you're going to be at the end of the line. Mm-hmm. Um, all you have to all you have to be thinking about is the next right thing. And there are clues to those things, both both internally, sort of like that internal call, and externally. What's coming at you? What are people telling you about? We really need someone like you to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so I wrote this book about how to identify clues and how to have the guts to follow them, because sometimes anxiety is so great um, when you're in transition that... Having a a serious thought, <laughs> much less following a yeah. train of thought, becomes really difficult. Yeah. Um, and so, but then also how to recognize the treasures that come up along the way too, because it's not only about where you're heading, but also the so many gifts along the way, and how do we recognize those and and um, receive them, but also um, put put that out into the world as well. Um, I love it because I we've talked before about visioning and when I used to do wellness coaching it was all about because a lot of the counseling theories are about exploring your past or Mm -hmm. you know what might have created this behavior you do and Mm. I don't know I just philosophically hate that approach because it's in the past A and B what does it matter you can fix you can either A, fix it, or B, you can make whatever life you want, mm-hmm. I believe. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of similar to that. Like, let's focus on the now, mm-hmm. not the five years ago, the one you were two, three, right. six months, everything your mom did wrong, mm-hmm. your dad, mm-hmm. it's all his fault. You know, that can't be healthy, right? <laughs> maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe there's a time. I'm not a therapist, but. Well, all of those kids on the border are going to have a lot of stuff to work well, through. Well, that's, I mean, that's. <laughs> That's terrible. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. I mean, not everybody's oh, not every true. Right. Oh yeah. my gosh. Not not everybody has I a know. past worth. My, you know right. that. Yeah. I mean, ugh, you know, you haven't oh. had that kind of trauma in your childhood. No, that I'm aware of. But then sometimes I I don't know because again I'm not a therapist. But sometimes thinking about it and revisiting it often so much, I I think can be debilitating to moving forward. But I'm sure at points you do need to, again, I'm not a therapist. Well, this is kind of like your church shopping thing. Yeah. You're going back and you're going, wait a minute, I remember all these points. So right. you're processing that, but then you're saying, okay, but I have a vision that there is a church for me right. to mm-hmm. go forward. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yet, yet another thing to balance, I yeah, think. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, how much how much are you shaped by that and how much does it help to explore that and recognize that? And I think also sometimes find the gifts in it, which are often really, really hidden. I mean, not everybody has a past that they want to explore and spend a lot of time thinking about either. Right, right. Um, but I think... You know, for me, a lot of the students I met were just so anxious. I mean, they're in many cases, their parents had invested so much in their education. Mm -hmm. And it just was really hard to even ask themselves what what were what was happening inside themselves and where was it leading them, but also how to recognize the clues that were coming to them. Um, And so I was trying to give them a way to think to approach it with a sense of curiosity and a sense of adventure rather than this anxiety um, and like they were trying to build something and it might fall apart at any moment and they weren't sure if once they got it built they were really going to like it. Mm. So it just it seemed like a different framework and that's the framework I'm trying to live with right now. I mean it's I get I get plenty of opportunities to go back and go. Does this really work? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What are the clues? Maybe if I go on this podcast, there'll be some clues there. <laughs> well, I think with with college age students too. I can't tell you how many I've had in my office crying because they're not doing well. Mm-hmm. And but then when you kind of get into 
the motivation and desire to why they wanted to be a nurse, it never was their own. Mm. And I, I see this so much with college students is that parents, and I think it's, again, I don't think this is ever coming from a vindictive place, but parents want the best for their kids. And I think a lot of times parents, especially in careers like nursing, where you can graduate, have a job, insurance, yep. money, et cetera, they, kids can get pushed into careers that are, you know, you're dealing with human lives and there's a lot that's wrapped into it that ne- just may not be their strength. You know, they may be better baker or Mm -hmm. artist or whatever, but they've been pushed into this direction. So they're constantly in this conflict of, oh, my parents paid for this. They think I should do this. They believe I can. I can't. I hate it. But, you know, we'll so kind of just giving them permission to to say to kind of explore the motivation and desire to why they even want to be a nurse in the first Mm -hmm. place. And so many times it comes out. Mm -hmm. I don't I didn't. Mm. I didn't, you know, and then making them kind of feel like it's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. your parents aren't that's, gonna be happy. I told you that's, that. <laughs> that's the kind of life coaching I'd really, I'd really like to do. Is, yeah. You know, sort of ask, help people ask those big questions at times of transition, right? Um, because sometimes, I, I think sometimes it's you can you can find people to help you figure out the math on student debt and what will provide right. health insurance, and that is all really helpful. I mean, I say that in the book, like yeah. a need to pay the bills is a really big clue. Right. right. Like, do not discount this as important. Right. But it's not the only source of information. Right. But it's often the resources that you're surrounded by. It's often the easiest sort of way to find company in asking these questions. And so I'm like, if you don't have a faith community or a parent or a mentor or a teacher who knows how to help you ask those questions, who are you going to talk to about it? Right. And so I'm trying to figure out a way to offer to offer myself as one possible conversation partner in those sorts of situations, not only in college, but also at other transitions in life. Yeah, changing changing faith communities, divorce. Yep. Oh, big the divorce time. probably be a yeah. big yeah, I have Just been. I numbers. have been through that. Yeah, and it is wow. Is it a chance to ask big questions? Right, <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> so, do you want to, any final thoughts before we move on to our favorite things? Oh. Just just how much fun this is. <laughs> we have to have you back on. I would yeah. love I would love I mean this is thank you. Yeah, this thank you. Really. Um, really. I, you're yeah. a great guest cuz we've been I keep Well, she said a, a couple, she said it like multiple times, which is kind of like the whole mission of our podcast is that we are more alike than different. Yes. And yeah. that everyone is more alike than different if you find that common ground. Yeah. Right. I mean as as an atheist, like how how is this conversation can I can I ask for your final thought? Like how does this conversation <laughs> Well, but for you, things, did you feel outside of it at points or does it feel like you were not a conversation? necessarily because because I because even without a faith community, I my community is Bangor. I want to make connections. And I just had this experience like a week ago. Do you remember this day when there were all these like random connections that I was making for people? And it was so it, like I, I was texting Kelly. I'm like, oh, my God, I had somebody who was. A producer for a TV show in New York City who was looking for a location up here to do a, a shoot. And then, so Kelly, you said in pics, I mm-hmm. found a place up in Patton, but then she was like, Well, what's Patton like? And I said, Well, actually, let me connect you to Melanie Brooks, who was just on with the main highlights. Yes. So she got in touch with her to get some resources on that. And then there was. They did email me and they want to use our house for a different shoot. Oh, really? Yeah, because it, awesome this didn't it. work for the one. Yeah. Yeah. So I so I helped this. So like a friend of a friend, I made this connection. And then there was, I can't remember what the other ones were. Oh, um, it was one of our listeners who's moving here had questions about martial arts for kids. And I don't, my kids don't do it, but I have a friend who does. So I said, hey, what can you tell me about martial arts? For? And she, I copied and pasted her text to me and emailed it back to the listener person. I said, here you go. And then there was, and then at the end of the day, I got this message from a former student who out of the blue reached out and said, hey, when the school year is over, can we get together and have a coffee? I have some big changes coming up in my life and I really feel like you'd be a good person to listen. Mm -hmm. And I was like, sure. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Like, it's great. But I was like, so I was like, I have this thing for making connections. So I feel like I've made a really good connection because I, and I've said this all along. I'm like, Kelly, you've got to meet Rebecca Mm -hmm. because you guys are Mm -hmm. both very strong in your faith Mm -hmm. and also in your faith in humans, Mm -hmm. not just God. You know what I mean? So I feel like, so I feel like I've made a good connection. But I also feel like since I've known you, You've been not that you were ever closed off to religion, and not that I ever expect you to like change your atheism or anything like that. But like her daughter, 
got a book <laughs> at um, at Target, I think, and it said Faith on it, and she really wanted it. It was a journal. A journal, oh. yeah. And she said, Faith can have more meanings than just religious meetings. Well, and the thing and, was, it was with all these other like prayer journals. Yeah, it, mm-hmm. it didn't have like prompts. It was just line journal, uh-huh. and like it was like pray more and keep calm and pray on, like all these. And then there was one that just said Faith, and she loved it. And I was like. Ugh. <laughs> okay. And I was like, okay, look, no, like it could mean have faith in yourself. It could yeah. mean have faith in something else. It doesn't mean have faith in God. I'm not, you're not converting to a religion in right. the Target journal aisle. It's all good. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 So, but if she could do it, it wouldn't make her a horrible human. And I would, I would be fine with that yeah. if she wanted to. Like, exactly. Ahead, like I'm, I, you know, if she went to some fundamentalist extremist <laughs> hate based religion, then no, I'm going to have a problem with that. <laughs> Won't let her. No. <laughs> But if she wants to explore religion in her due, own due time, then go ahead. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. So I, I do have a f- quick final thought. Yes. Um, I just so appreciate this space because I think sometimes, you know, it's that old saying about like, just avoid talking about religion and politics and yes. it will all be fine. That's how I was raised. I, th- I th- But I think... Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, we've cut ourselves off from all sorts of conversations that yeah. may go there. I right. mean, I think that's partly why it's so hard to find somebody sometimes to talk to. Like, you know, the person who said, I think you might be a good play- person to talk to. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's hard to know who who you can talk to mm-hmm. about just big questions and meaning and faith. And, mm-hmm. um, and so I just appreciate this space that you have with each other and that mm-hmm. you invite other people into, because I think that is so important and so valuable. And so just where we could be mm-hmm. with all of us nuns and sums mm-hmm. who are finding different resources in different religious traditions and, and trying to use them for the good of all. I mean... Mm-hmm. There's yeah, my, there's my little preachy moment. Healthy conversations without feeling like you're going to get judged or you're going to ha- get your head taken off for saying for believing one way or the other. But right. just mutual respect. I I completely agree. I see it all the time. And just being a person who's kind of like um, towed the middle line between political groups and even within religious groups, and not realizing that I was kind of doing that. Um, I see that most people are on the same page about things. Mm-hmm. Now, some are very extreme, but if you get them out of that gunshot reaction to just say, no, I don't want to expand health care or no, I don't want immigration or but then you, you know, ha- talk to them a little deeper, you'll find, yes. oh, you know, you're really not that far off right. from where these people are. Of course, everyone there are extremists on both sides, but often when you get down to the nitty gritty of it, well, part you of really are more alike than different. people the space to like. Give, having the space to ask questions for me to be able to say, oh, so evangelical isn't bad, right? Yeah, right. Because <laughs> I know right, you're yeah. not bad. I know your church isn't. <laughs> right. But, yeah, but, but, but who else would, I mean, like, where can you, right. you know, th- th- there's all sorts of things. Yeah. Where, where can you ask people, well, what do you what do you think about Jesus? Right. I mean, you know, yeah. you, and I think that's why we end up so segregated in our mm-hmm. own little communities. I think we end up staying in opinions and forget that stories are what connect us much more strongly than mm-hmm. opinions. Absolutely. And you, you really would love the Liturgist podcast because they talk about this out. a lot. They talk about being lonely in your um, beliefs oh, yeah. and how there aren't a lot of senior leaders within religious and faith-based groups that will mentor people who huh. are younger, who have you know more liberal viewpoints on mm. social issues mm. but strong faith that those people are very um it's in low supply mm. high demand low supply <laughs> and then so many people are turning from from god and religion because of it because you see so much in the media that isn't the culture now you know in the way in my generation and then certainly my siblings generations are much younger than me are much more accepting mm-hmm than previous generations mm-hmm. and then when you see you know media portraying religion as such then people just say oh oh i'm not that so i'm going to stray away from it but maybe maybe they are maybe it's not as far off as they think right <laughs> it's <laughs> summer vacation, summer vacation. <laughs> our kids are balancing chaos directly above our heads <laughs> right now you hear that well i just saw james like come in it got real quiet and then james backed out and all of a sudden i was like boom 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 You're like party so. time yep <laughs> So, so what, favorite thing. Favorite thing. What's your favorite? Okay, thing so today? my favorite thing right now is Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that is such a great show. Oh my so goodness, sweet. it is. Um, 
it is responsible for so much emotional intelligence in our mm-hmm. household. My, so, I mean, the kids will like if they're fighting over something. Like one of them will sing the little song about taking turns. Aww. My my son actually, we were um, at a campground catching the bus into Acadia on Sunday, and we missed the bus and had to wait half an hour for the next one. And I was so we like we just missed it, Ugh. and I was so upset. And my son sang to me, "When you wait." You can play, sing, (laughs) or imagine anything. So he's saying that he's like, Mom, Daniel plays the animal guessing game. Let me teach you how to play it. Oh, my gosh. I mean, so, like, this is emotional intelligence, like, that my son is using to teach me. (laughs) But so it's great. I mean, like, we, yeah, Yeah. we use, like, all of the, all of the little songs. And my two-year-old can sing an amazing number of them and and knows how to use them so that is my favorite thing right now is daniel tiger's neighborhood what's the one when you feel so mad oh yeah i don't turn it around oh yeah when something seems bad Bad. turn Turn it it around around and find find something something good (laughs) yes my my brother are are just out of it but my nephew loves it oh it it missed us so helpful yeah it is helpful um, and, and can you tell us? I want you to tell us about this book because you mentioned. Oh yeah, yeah. My, so my other he's doing a double thing. favorite thing. Yes, and and this fits right in with the whole we love Bangor. Um, <laughs> so it's a book by Melody Warnick. It's called "This Is Where You Belong: The Art and Science of Loving the Place You Live." And I think it was. I'm trying to see what year it was. Um, 2016. So a recent book and just. A lot of her own experience. It, it's a little bit um, similar to the Happiness Project, oh, yeah, in the like, sense of like doing the research and then choosing to try something and see what effect it has. Like a series of experiments. It goes really well with the Treasure Hunt of Your Life, actually. I'm pretty series sure of that, I've got, that we've gotten um, listeners, or, like subscribers on Podbean, that, who are like a no one we know, but they also listen to the Gretchen Rubin podcast. Oh. I wonder if they think I'm Gretchen Rubin. Uh. <laughs> I'm Gretchen Schaefer. <laughs> And that is way better. We should read that book in book club. We should. We should totally do that. That's a good one. What's What's your favorite thing, Kelly? Okay. So I know that people probably think I have an unhealthy love of Whole Foods. <laughs> which is, I may Is agree. there such a thing? It's just, I go in there, I feel peace. The store is designed so beautifully. I just went there yesterday. The staff are so friendly. They will do anything. They're so helpful. Anyway... But my my favorite thing is the they have these taco bowls. Oh my gosh, they're so good. I'm craving one right now. <laughs> so I think it's the chicken that makes it so good because it's marinated in something, so it's not dry. It's very moist. And they put uh, lettuce, rice, all the vegetables. And they do exotic vegetables, too, and I just take everything they have. And this chicken with guacamole, it's so good. I wish I could have one today. Oh. See, there's a church somewhere in this country, oh. maybe not in Bangor, but there's a church, I'm sure, somewhere that is trying to make itself feel like Whole Foods so that you feel that way when you walk into the church that you feel like you're at Whole Foods. That is such a great point because I used to love... (laughs) Somebody has figured this out somewhere. I used to love grocery shopping. It was my favorite thing to do. This is partially how I became the food planner grocery shopper because I just love it. I love reading books about food. I love the store. It's peaceful in there. It's a wonderful experience. I go to Hannaford or Shaw's or any other place and I just don't feel, I actually hate it. I'm stressed by the time I leave. I'm irritable. And something about Whole Foods just brings me peace. That's why I really wish we could get one here. It's going to be a while. But the bus, that would be great. They could come maybe at the farmer's market. <laughs> I could order. No, you, no, 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 no. You can't come to the farmer's why? market. It's big business tramping out all the all the small mm, but you can't get everything at the farmers, farmers market i'm sure they would partner with the farmers market for the vegetables they're all about local maybe sourcing i'm skeptical about big amazon eradicating our farmers market and you did see the bouquets i sent yes yeah. 16 dollar bouquets that are not even half the size of our fisher farms not nearly as beautiful and ours Whole we Foods. worked out it's like three dollars a week with a yeah. flower share yeah flower share yeah Okay. So my favorite thing is a website called she should run.org. And she has, should run? She should run.org, not legs. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I know where this is going. Mm-hmm. And it has an I am con- I am considering so this is like love the place you live and making connections and finding out how to do better in your community. So I'm considering running for city council. Excellent. My Leslie no- moment. Yes. And <laughs> she should run.org has like a whole 
like a workshop that you get like online self-paced online class that you can go through and like go through and what is your vision? What is and so it's been really interesting. So I'm doing that right now. Just kind of I'm discerning. Yes, just you are <laughs> discerning. discerning. But I'm going time. through and thinking like what is it that I like about Bangor and what do I want to and so like one of mine was um in my work in my mission statement is welcoming neighborhoods. Yeah. And I specifically thought welcoming neighborhoods and not safe neighborhoods, mm. which sounds weird, mm-hmm. but no, I feel it makes like total safe sense. neighborhoods has this it has a different connotation to me and I feel like I can really get into income disparities and have questions about that but I want people to feel welcome in their neighborhood mm. and when you feel welcome in your neighborhood you feel safe in your neighborhood right mm-hmm. yeah. so like yeah. that's one of my things of, so you're talking about like going through and finding like the treasure hunt and yeah. figuring out what it is so that's one of so my things so you're looking for clues so I'm looking for clues and someone yeah. was like I think that what I think that what we have here, I feel like we have a welcoming neighborhood. Yeah. Even when somebody on our on our Facebook group joked about how they need to interview potential buyers for their house, they're leaving the neighborhood to make sure that that they'll fit in. And somebody else was like, "What do you mean fit in?" And they're like, "Well, no, I'm you know like they understand this is a good neighborhood, and you know, and it was clearly like almost a tip to the unwelcoming neighborhood, like make sure that you're the right person. Yeah. But then in the conversation that followed amongst the people, they were like, "Oh no," and it was a family that's a multiracial family, and like. No, we don't want it to be a specific type of family. We just want them to know what they're getting and make sure that right. we're keeping up with this welcoming neighborhood. Is yeah. you know they didn't say that, but that was the gist that I got. Sorry, so I'm going through that process, and it's the yeah. She Should Run Incubator, and it's a neat little workshop with some readings and some videos and some kind of mm. exercises to think about the idea of running for office. Yeah, I didn't want to get the neighborhood watch signs for that same reason. Yeah, I was really hates. Them. I was totally against them. I think it also sends the message that maybe it's unsafe. Ingrid hates them. She thinks she's like they're so scary because it has that yeah. scary guy. With guy. The yeah, it is. And one of the options was like we look out for each other, and I felt like that was such a yes. better yeah. Yeah. type of sign. Yeah, versus like Me too. We're gonna hunt you down. Right. <laughs> We're gonna cope. We with call the police with suspicious when, activity. When you right. are on the city council, maybe you can get some. <laughs> yes, we look out for each other. Sex. We're welcoming mm-hmm. neighborhoods. So look at welcoming neighborhoods, and the other one is um, uh, broadband, municipal broadband. I think would be a real benefit to Bangor and its growing economy, and making it so that almost I can think of a dozen people who have gotten jobs in the last two years or whatever that are remote jobs, and they're working from home or they're working at a co-working space. And if we have municipal broadband, it would be a great asset to our community. Mm -hmm. So there, I'm working on my platform. There you go. (laughs) I'd I'd vote for you. I'd vote for you. (laughs) Anyway, so so that's my favorite thing. She should run.org, the incubator, to check it out if you're feeling inspired or motivated to do even more than what you're already doing. Nice. All right. Excellent. So, uh, So until next week, we will see you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.